In 2016, there were over 2,800 apparent opioid-related deaths in Canada. And those are only the Canadian numbers. In the U.S., where my next guest lives, the numbers are even higher. But no one ever thinks a drug epidemic like this is going to affect their lives, much less their own home. Welcome, Rick, to 100 Huntley Street. Thank you. So we all have these dreams as parents that our kids are going to grow up, they're going to be doctors, lawyers, successful. Um, tell me about Tommy and when you started to notice something change in his life. Well, honestly, when it first, we first noticed something was wrong was when he didn't come home from school one day. Mm. And he was not that unusual because he had been on some restrictions for, we had noticed a little bit of a change in behavior. But by the time night fell, we started to get a little panicked. My wife was even more panicked than I at mm -hmm. that point. And as we started to investigate where he might be and speaking to friends, we found that he had, was using dangerous drugs and, and uh, could be in, in danger. It started off with marijuana. Well, it, it started out with, with he, had, he had fallen into uh, Oxycontin. He had gotten it in the high school where, where a policeman once told me it was as rampant and easy to get as, as candy at a 7-Eleven. Mm. Now, you're a journalist by trade. And, yes. And so as you're going through this journey with your son and finding out that eventually he had an opioid addiction, you started doing some research on yes. where OxyContin, where op opioids come from. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, the more research I did, the, m the angrier I got, actually, yeah. as we were into this, because I found out that this was entirely a man-made epidemic. And for over a decade, OxyContin, um, Purdue Pharma, the maker of OxyContin, deceptively marketed it as a non-addictive substance, mm. when it couldn't be further from the truth, because if you crush the pills, as kids and many others found out, not to mention all the people who had minor surgeries or, or wisdom teeth out or whatever that were pre over prescribed these drugs, uh, that they could be very addictive quickly. Mm. And you say in the book, uh, two thirds of teens get these pills from family or friends who, you know, had them uh, given to them or prescribed them because of back pain or some sort of uh, pain and forget about them. And then these kids get a hand on. Them. Absolutely. And, and it's really opi opioids in the pain pill form are essentially synthetic heroin. Mm. One's made in a street lab heroin. Which, which carries a huge stigma, and one is made in a pharmaceutical lab. But in the end, they're, they're both equally addictive and, and equally deadly over time. You had an argument with Tommy, and he ran away one evening, and uh, you ended up following him into a barracks kind of area in your yes. town. Um, that's when it started to really hit home that Tommy had a severe problem. Right, as the first few days when he was missing, and we were searching for him every day, and, and we're not talking 24 hours, it was more, you know, past 72 hours. That's when we really started to realize what a life and death struggle we were in. Mm. And so when you found Tommy, you've gone through now how many different rehab clinics with Tommy? Tommy has been through, at this point, 13 relapses. He's, he's been through eight residential and outpatient rehab type programs at a cost to our family, most of that, which we still carry in debt mm -hmm. of over $200,000. Uh, he has been homeless. He's twice been been jailed for short periods of time for possession and, uh, and twice resuscitated from death by overdose through CPR. And what is that like as a father when you hear that your son has almost overdosed, is so close to death? It's terrible and I've been asked what is the low point and that was the low point hearing that he was in a, um, he had been resuscitated and put into another, another clinic for a few days. Mm -hmm. um, I think the the really opioid addiction is so difficult to overcome because it alters the brain chemistry. Mm -hmm. In a sense, it hijacks the brain. So it is extraordinarily difficult for someone who has become addicted to overcome the addiction. Yeah, and so this young, sensitive. Boy, when it was 16 when he yes. initially, when you felt young, sensitive Tommy 
became somebody different. Describe who he was when he was on opi opioids. The, d the biggest difference was, uh, and again, this was my most gentle out of our four ch children, our most sensitive, sweet, and, and very engaging young man. Mm -hmm. um, when he was on drugs, he was, he was like uh, a robot in a sense. He, you know, no emotion, no passion, just kind of a blank stare. And, and really all that is on the mind of somebody in that state is to use again and to get do whatever they have to do to get more drugs. They have no comprehension of, of the damage they're doing to their family or, or the impact they're having on others around them. It's, it's all about the drug. And this meant stealing from you guys? Certainly, and his siblings. Yeah, and pawning things off just to Absolutely, get time to and time again. Well, we are going to take a quick break, but when we come back, Rick describes the turning point for his son Tommy and their family. Stay with us.